Welcome to the Jeremiah Show. So Pete Muller has me thinking about how creating is so important to daily survival, right? What happens to us when we ignore it? When I am learning most about myself, it's always during a creative time. When a creative process is worked through for me, not always finished, it offers perspective to me and most often inspiration. Creation can be like reading the tea leaves. The wonderful thing about creativity is that it doesn't have to be my own to inspire me. And as I listen to Pete Muller's new album, More Time, I think, isn't it cool that we as human beings, we can also be inspired and creative, find answers and passion through what others have created. Music is a powerful example of this. I guess that I do so many shows focused on music because I'm trying to understand where it comes from. Music makes me feel like no other art form does. I want to understand why. Like a good film can move you. It can be powerful visually and it can remind us of humanity through the story. It can be moving with a big music score. But very soon the emotional impact of that film will be gone, at least for me. An actor's performance makes me feel that in the moment, but then it's gone and it fades and it's forgotten. A painting can stir up questions and awe for its beauty, but soon the image fades, if not in front of you. An author can wrap you up and take you to all sorts of places with a good book, but then those feelings at the moment will also eventually fade. The details are usually forgotten. Music moves you on all of these visceral levels. But a favorite song is imprinted within you forever. It becomes a marker in your life from the moment you first heard it. It echoes in your mind and your body when recalled. It is there at a moment that you need it. It can bring you back to a happy moment with a lover or a friend. Or when you are a child again. A teenager or navigating your adulthood, lyrics stay with you. You are reminded of how you felt, and it comes back to serve as your guide. It comforts you. It's deeply personal to you. And while others may enjoy the same song, the same music, it's not theirs. It's your song. It is your soundtrack. It is your music. Music comes from many different countries, many different times, and many different people. I think it is our most common thread for humanity, and I think the most powerful interpreter of our life's important moments. A good song never dies and never goes away. So music artists inspire me. They interest me. I put them up on a high pedestal in my life. My special guest today is one such artist I hold in this regard, Pete Muller. Pete understands music and its relation to time, or he is attempting to. It's a subject he has explored well in his eight albums released so far. Pete has me thinking about creation and all of the beautiful things that come from it. His new album is a great example. His song started with him for him but they are now my songs the new album is more time welcome pete muller uh, thanks jeremiah it's great to be here good to see you my friends okay so let's get right into it uh i have a limited amount of time with you and i want to get to know as much about your process as possible and this new album is really great congratulations i know it just you just released it at the end of may uh really really great work congratulations Thank, thank you so much. Uh, okay, so you've described yourself as having two sides. One part of you, this is what you said, one part of me is very practical, analytical uh, thinker, and the other is this creative artist who can't help but express what's going on in his soul. Um, we are always told, right, that people are either one side or another in the brain, their left brain, their right brain. So if you're mostly analytical and methodical in your thinking, the theory suggests be that you're left brain. If you tend to be more creative or artistic, you are right brain. 
And it also suggests that one side of your brain is more dominant over the other. Well, you're saying that you feel both. And I guess my question for you is they must contradict one another <laughs> from time to time in your life. Have you discovered the magic trick to make both sides work of your brain to satisfy the desire of the other over the other? Well, get along? you know, when I, uh, I've, I've built a successful business. I uh, create crossword puzzles. Uh, that's a separate thing than the business, which is based on math. It's crazy. Uh, and when I do those things, uh, you're the guy I've always wondered who did those. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> those. the analytical brain is, is in charge. Uh, but the emotional part, the creative part part is there. There's a lot of creativity in business and in puzzles. And similarly, when I'm writing a song and music, uh, the emotion is paramount, but the, the structural, the analytical part is, is incredibly important in terms of, okay, what's the right structure for this song? What's where the right chord inversions? How do I think about this thing? How do I think about arranging it? So I, I find the two are, uh, are actually um, work in harmony much more than they're in opposition. And, uh, you know, the, the, um, the creative side, the emotion, the musical side is dominant when I'm doing music. Right. And that doesn't really come out. It's not like I'm singing melodies when I'm running the company, but the creativity is in both places. Um, so, uh, yeah, I actually so I, I went to New York uh, many years ago to 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 uh, because I had a, an offer I couldn't refuse uh, to, to do something that many thought was uh, pretty impossible, which was using math to beat the markets. And I threw myself into it. It was really obsessive. I lived in New York. I had a had a grand piano in my apartment and I hardly touched it. And that was okay while I was building and, and getting successful. But then once things got successful, I stayed obsessive and I really hadn't didn't find my way back to the piano. And there were a lot of emotions inside that weren't coming out. And that led to my life blowing up a little bit. And that blowing up led to my starting to write songs and then really wanting to get good at writing songs and performing. And I threw myself into that. But as I did it, I realized that, that I really loved the math part of my brain, too, and that a life where I only did one or the other wasn't going to work for me. I had to exercise both and go back and forth between the two. And that the common link, there, there are two common links. One is creativity. Um, it, it's really paramount in both. How do I do something that hasn't been done before? Okay, how do I get to a centered place where I really feel something and then, 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 then make it up? Um, but then the other part is, is emotional awareness, being very in touch with what I'm feeling and understanding how to manifest it and when to express it, when not to, but always being aware of it. And then also being in touch with what others are feeling so that I can build trust and motivate them and help them succeed and do the best that they can do. And it's much easier running a company when you find really great people that are super smart, that trust you, that want to collaborate with you as opposed to doing it yourself. So, so the emotional side is so important in both. And I, I can't imagine my life without both. Uh, like most people, you are, you're realistic and what you know, where you knew you could make a living and support a family uh, was the business aspect. I love that you're right. Like a great business person calls in a lot of creativity and creates things that have never been created and sees problems and solves them so i can see that that coming into it but uh, uh the music side did you ever doubt that you could and did you care did you say i've just got to support this side of me the emotional side uh the spiritual side that needs the music and needs to express myself in that way did you care if it you were successful i mean obviously you want to be successful but monetarily wise i mean the, the world we we grow up and we live in a world that needs money to survive uh, for our existence. And the music is a luxury in, in a way, isn't it? And then, you know, I, um, how did you, I'm, I'm lucky that? enough that when I started doing music seriously, I have a luxury that anything I make in music, I give away. I do a lot philanthropically on the music side. I, I support a number of independent venues. And uh, uh, so, so I, I, I didn't do the music for money. But I also didn't do the business for money, which is interesting. When I, when I started trying to figure out how to beat the markets using math, it was a puzzle. It was a game. And I, uh, you know, it was as, as interesting as Scrabble or poker. I mean, you can make money playing poker. You can't really 
playing Scrabble. But uh, I just love the challenge of the game of figuring out the puzzle. The great thing about doing it in financial markets is that there, there's a lot of reward that comes. But I didn't have a family. I just had to support myself. I, I, I didn't do it for anything other than the challenge. And maybe that, that's one of the reasons I ended up being pretty good at it is that I really have passion for solving the problem as opposed to doing it. Oh, I have to get this, do this job to make money. I mean, I, I, people ask me for advice about what to do in life. And I'm one of those people that said, says, figure out what you're really passionate about and then get really good at it. Just keep doing it. I mean, people start with different levels of talent in different places, but if you put hard work into something that you really care about and you take feedback, you can get good at a lot of things. Right, including music. Right, you you can figure out how to make money at music if that's what you need to do. And but mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. So I I think if you're if you're, if money is your motivator, that's fine. It's great. You know, you have to pay the bills. But but life is short. You know, you know that it depends on on what you want. I I see a lot of people uh, in Santa Barbara that that spend too much time trying to make sure they have enough money or status as opposed to enjoying what there yeah. is. And it comes to you, you're a perfect example of that I think that uh, if you follow what makes you happy and uh, you're going to be successful uh, as long as you take that seriously, you know, and you, you get up every day excited about solving the puzzles, solving the problems and using your time wisely. Well, you grew up in New Jersey. Where did you grow up in, in New Jersey? Which town? I, I haven't grown up yet. I was raised in <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good answer. I'm going to have to steal um, that from you, Pete. Sure, that, feel free. Uh, my mom <laughs> was uh, a doctor from the south of Brazil. She was a small town doctor. In fact, only the, the, the only doctor in town um, in this small mountain town. And my dad was an engineer from Austria. They both met in the States. They had me and I, I was raised with my sister in uh, North Jersey, a suburb of New York City. And there were sidewalks and manicured lawns and it was a safe existence but a little too boring for me would you sing about which song is that i remember those that lyrics is, uh, great it's a uh, walk on water walk on water and a uh, recon a uh, recon makes an appearance in there exactly. <laughs> a special mention you know i i learned to surf uh uh I went on, it was a family trip. I think we went to Hawaii and I, I got to get on a surfboard at Waikiki. And I was like, oh man, I need to learn how to do this. But I didn't really learn how to do it until I moved to Santa Barbara and started surfing Rincon. And uh, I remember seeing it in the summer and thinking, oh, this looks pretty flat, which it was. But I, I don't know, are you a surfer? Uh, Rincon always intimidated me. No, I'm not. I've surfed once and I, that was such a shame down at Ledbetter Beach. But Rincon intimidated me. I would hear the stories about that's the like if you're going to surf, that's the spot on the West Coast, and uh, everybody's really territorial. It was probably myth, or maybe it's a no, little bit no. Of both. You need. I mean, it used to be really territorial, and people would have their car windows uh, <laughs> smashed in, and uh, you know, if you if you weren't a local, that those days are long gone. But it is definitely a place where you need to be competent if you're in the water. You need to know what you're doing or you're going to get yelled at or hurt. And when I first got out there, I was a little tentative, but I figured out how, how to be there and, you know, surf there a lot. And I'm very comfortable down there. I love going down there. No, and you're good, huh? <laughs> I, I will go out, uh, you know, I'll go out uh, up till about, uh, oh, these days, maybe 10 feet. And then I'm, I'm comfortable. When it gets bigger than that, I, I'll, I'll watch from the shore. But, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's just so wonderful being What out. does it give to you, to you? What does it add to your life, that the water, the surf? Oh, man, just like it, it, it's a peace. It's a calm. Um, you know, you're out there and you, you see dolphins and sea lions and pelicans. And there's just this vibe. And when, and when you're, so if you're, you're just waiting for a wave, it's just peaceful. Um, and then when you actually catch it and you're on the water and, and you know, riding on the water occasionally with a dolphin it, it it's just magical and then you ride the wave you just get back and you get you're getting exercise you're just in in cold salt water which is great for your body i mean it, it's just it just makes me very happy a lot of people um and i think these are some themes then that in your lyrics and your album uh the new album more time um a lot of people chase happiness uh but don't find it because it, they're chasing it almost like they're chasing the money. Right. And you don't, so you don't find the, 
the beauty and whatever you're doing, you, it, it becomes a chore. Uh, it sounds like that you, Pete, have found out, a, you, you've discovered yourself and, and found a way to bring the joy, the passion to your life and every day. Is that, would that be true? You question a lot of things in your lyric. You, you, you're definitely a, a thinker and add a little gold out, but it feels like it's natural. It comes natural to you. Is that true? A true statement or a true Definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty driven. So, I mean, I will do yoga every day. I'll do something cardio every day. I'll do, I'll solve a bunch of puzzles every day to keep my puzzle brain sharp. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll play music every day. Clearly that that's a big thing that I do. Um, and I, I love to be productive and try to, and devote myself to, to work. I was just saying this to somebody earlier today that I think the secret in life is to take your work incredibly seriously, but not yourself seriously. And I, I aspire to that. Mm, good point. So, but, but, but I mean, if I, I've been writing a lot of songs and in fact, I have more than enough songs for the record that's going to come after this one. And I'm trying to think about what to do with it. Um, but the way I write is I have a group, uh, I put together a song circle and uh, we have five people in it and you know other people we, we limit it to five we, we can get a lot more um and we meet uh for four or five weeks in a row and you have to show up with a new song and you play it for the group you play it twice and you share the lyrics and people comment and because i have that deadline and i have to write a song i write a song if i didn't have that deadline i would write far fewer songs now, if I, if I did that every week, um, you know, maybe I'd be trying to make a living as a professional songwriter and what you do, I, that doesn't work for me. But, but you know, I, if I write uh, 10 or 15 songs a year, that's great. That's enough for a record um, every, every couple of years because I'm not going to, you know, record every single one of them. And it's, it's the right balance for me. But I need that mm. discipline, that deadline, that pressure. I work well with that pressure. Mm. Do you take it right to the edge, to the to the deadline? Uh, are you that type of pressure? Deadline Very occasionally. Person, I mean, it's really hard to write. I mean, to, to I'll keep editing till the deadline if I'm not doing anything before we're meeting. As as do other people in the group do the same thing. Um, but I try to finish it the night before and then sleep on it and go, okay, what does it sound like today? Do I like I it? Like at it, yeah. But you really, you figure out how much you like the song when you start playing it for others not by their reaction, but by what you feel while you're playing it for them. And that, that, that's when you really get to know it. Um, well, I, I was looking at you, since you you brought this, you brought songwriting up and, and uh, your albums, your discography, I was looking at it. I'm going to mention here. So just one lifetime, that was 2001. 2001, that's right. More than this, 2003. So I can tell you a little bit about each. So, so just one lifetime, I... I wanted to make a record and I asked a friend if I could for a recording engineer and they said, well, you probably need a producer. And I, in my naivete said, well, what does a producer do? <laughs> and they said, well, the producer kind of figures out how to arrange it and make it all better. And like, I, I can do all that. Just get, get me a recording engineer and I'll record it in my part. <laughs> Came out fine. And, but it was Spartan, you know, yeah. it just did a, bunch, a few takes and, you know, Put out that record and there's some cool raw stuff in there that i really like but for my next record which you're about to say uh you know i found a producer more than this more than this yeah and that one um that one went deep there's some there's some stuff uh that i really like on that the title cut on more than this is a spoken poem with it with a refrain it was awesome and and there are a few songs in there that i still play that was really fun uh, and then there was a big hiatus because I was going to say that's that was my big question because I looked at like 2001, 2003, so two years, then nothing until 2015, or at least that I know of an exactly. album, exactly. Two Truths and a Lie, 2015. What ha what were, what happened in between there? Why, why was there that gap? Was that where you created this new business? That that, that no, not really. No, I I um. I, I had a bunch of songs ready in 2005 and that's when I met the woman that was, that became my wife and okay. met her in New York city and uh, things moved fairly quickly. And I got, I got, I got reinvolved with the business, but we also moved to Santa Barbara. We had two kids and the momentum that I had uh, kind of, kind of stalled for a bit. Yeah. I had 
piano songs, I was going back and forth to New York City where the business is. Real life got you for a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, I was I was playing music though. Like I'd, I'd learned that lesson of not, you know. So I, every month there was a place in the city called Cafe Vivaldi and I would get together with my band and a bunch of friends at the time and we would just, you know, we would take over the club, the, the, the restaurant for the night and have friends come. And, you know, that was my main performance thing. It was great. Um, uh, we had the kids, we, you know, came out, they got, they got to school. And then my business actually had been part of a bank, but we spun out in 2012. And then by 2014, I was ready. I'm like, okay, I, I want to get these songs out because I've got a lot more coming. So yeah. How did that feel like the, like you had it, it's all built up. You needed to dig. Yeah, no, I, I had to do. And then there were some new ones that I, I wrote too. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, I wrote this song for my wife called Trust His Heart, um, which was the first love song I, I, I wrote for her. And uh, a friend of mine who's no longer with us, a guy named Rick DePoffey, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was on the Berkeley Board of uh, Trustees for the, for the college. And uh, I, through them, I tried to get a hold of John Laventhal, who made a record for Sean Colvin, one of my favorite artists. And I found John and I said, John, I want you to make my next record. And he said, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm not anybody in the business and you work with the best names, but maybe you'd want to do it. And he said, he said, well, you know, I don't know if I have time, but the guy that I make my, all my records with is a guy named Rick DePoffey and he could be good for you. And I called Rick and uh, I still remember this. And, and Rick is unfortunately no longer with us. He had a brain tumor and very sad um, that he died early. But uh, Rick was also a surfer. And I, I went down and I met him in a studio in New York. And, and he said, you know, play me some stuff. And I sat down on the piano and played him a few songs. And he was like, eh, I don't know, man. You know, that, that's cool, Pete. I, I, I got to get out of here. I'm going down to, you know, I'm going out to Long Island to, um, to surf. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, let's talk next week. And I'm like, oh, you're a surfer. <laughs> and I said, Rick, let me show you a picture of uh, where I live in California. And I showed him a picture of Rincon. And I said, I'm a surfer. And if you come out and we make a record in California, you can surf on <laughs> every day. And he said, man, that's not fair. That's not <laughs> fair. Well, we became fast friends. And it was really interesting because he's an amazing producer. He was the perfect, perfect guy for me. Um, helped me so much vocally and arrangement wise. And uh, interestingly, he was trying to learn about uh, trading options. So we would, uh, you know, when we would fly together, um, I'd be working on song lyrics and he'd be looking at stock charts. It's hilarious. We laughed at but, um, but we made a great record and some of the recording we did in New York City at a place called Power Station. Mm -hmm. and, um, after making that record, I, I realized, okay, I'm, I'm on a roll. I want to keep going. I'm going to keep going. And, and that was two truths and a lie. And I said, Rick, I need, I need a studio in New York City. I want to, you know, let's, I want to find a studio apartment. You can build out studios. He had built John Laventhal's studio. John's married to Roseanne Cash, great studio. And we recorded a little there as well. And uh, I said, uh, let's go find something. And he came back to me. This was after the diagnosis of his brain tumor. And, and he said, Pete, um, I just found out that power station where we recorded is about to be sold and it's, uh, it's going to be, get turned into condos. Um, I thought maybe, you know, I had this crazy idea. You could, you could buy it and make it the Berkeley School of Music in New York. You could put your studio on the fifth floor and, um, you know, uh, what do you think? And I, and I, Power Station was this crazy, dilapidated place, an amazing recording studio. I mean, on, you know, on par with Abbey Road in terms of yeah. the number of people that have recorded their Springsteen. And mention a couple of those, if you don't mind. Oh, Springsteen, Lady Gaga, cast album for Hamilton, uh, you know, Prince, ton, tons and tons of people, did, you know, actually, I'm not sure if Prince did, but, but uh, uh, the list goes on and on and on in terms of uh, the amazing people that recorded at Power Station. Um, so they're going to turn it into condos. They were going to they just sell it because it's just hard to make money in the recording business. There was a yeah. Japanese fellow that bought it for 20 years and he barely broke even and he just wanted to get his money back. And uh, anyway, long story short, the first thing I told Rick was, yeah, the brain tumor is kicking in. There's no way I'm doing this. And then sure enough, I ended up doing it. Um, and we, um, now, yeah. What, what moment changed your mind? Well, how did your, how did you say, okay, I'm not going to do it. You're crazy. No. Okay. I'm going to do it. And then I must have been thought, incredible. Uh, thought, you know, the universe told me it was time to do it. 
And what was interesting, when the universe, you know, I just woke up and I said, oh shit, I think I have to do this. And the karma that came back was really interesting because at the launch party, when we finally opened it, there's a fellow named Rob Mathis, who was amazing. And Rob, um, how do I describe Rob? Sting offered Rob a full-time job and he turned it down. <laughs> he, he's probably the best arranger in the world. Strings and horns. Uh, I'm a pretty damn good piano player. He's way better than I am. He's amazing. Uh, he's a better guitar player than most people you know. He's, his voice is incredible. He, he's just, he's a monster. Um, and uh, he came at the launch party, he came up and found me. He said, who are you? Who are you? I, I don't know you, but you have no idea what you did. You saved this incredible studio. I'm wow. forever grateful to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What do you need? Is there anything you need? And I said, well, actually, I mean, I, I need a producer. <laughs> there you go. And he said, but you work with Rick DePoffey. Rick is great. He's amazing. I said, Rick is not going to be making any more records, unfortunately. And, uh, and Rob said, I'm your man. Um, and he made my next two records, which you, you know, just so you're getting doing the discography. So he made the next two, which were uh, Dissolve and Spaces. 2019. The sound, uh, 220, 2021, was that in be, that's in between the spaces, right? Um, yeah, the sound, um, those are, but those two were both Pete Mahler solo albums. Okay. We'll get to the sound in a second, which is in between. But um, working with Rob was transformational. Um, How so? He is, he has such amazing ears in terms of very, every nuance. He would challenge every lyric choice we just got to be really we got to be close friends and and just um be able to just really fight and argue yeah. about best for the song and i learned so much working with him and, and did you I, like that as an artist did you like that challenge that that pushback at first it pissed me off but then i grew to love it and in fact the all the songs on this record i ran by rob and and heard his opinions and you know, I, I, I've grown so much, I grew through much through that time that I, you know, I end up, you know, uh, pushing back and winning a lot more. And Rob has, you know, learned, okay, oh, got it. You know, yeah, that's exactly right. That's cool. But, but, but he, I, I learned so much from him. But through that um, process, you, you, uh, was where, where you learned is where it made it better. Exactly. Exactly. I love being pushed. I mean, in, 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 in running a band and running a company, I, I tend to, if, if I make a mistake, it's to push people a little too much. I want more of them, you know, give it, give it. And, and so um, it was great. Those are all of these, the people I learned the most too. They said, no, you are wrong. And here's why. And I'm like, wait, nobody says that. Nobody ever, because you love employees, one, one person will do that. And when they do, you, you listen. I tell them all that. I want to hear, I want you to tell me when you think I'm wrong. Keep telling me when you think I'm wrong. And um, even if you're, if you turn out to be wrong, but you've genuinely thought about it, spend a lot of time on it, there's no, it, it's a great thing. I appreciate you taking the risk because when you're in a position of power, it's hard to find people who, who want to speak truth to you and are not afraid. Um, anyway, so those are the two Rob albums that I made, Spaces and Dissolve. And then uh, bookmarking in between, um, uh, I started traveling around with a band that uh, we called the Kindred Souls after a song of mine called uh, uh, Kindred Soul. And I have this gig where I create crossword puzzles for the Washington Post. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I've been doing it for 10 <laughs> years. It's only been gig. for four or five years. It's a monthly puzzle and it's called the Muller Monthly Music Meta. And the answer to the puzzle every month is either a band or a song. And cool. Kindred Souls, my touring band, we would record our version of the song and you know, everything from Take Me Home Country Roads to What Does the Fox Say, which is probably mm -hmm. the funniest video we ever did, which is really great. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we, we just came up with a lot of covers. And at one point we said, you know, let's take the best songs, our favorites, and make a cover record. And so we made that with Peter Cadis in Connecticut. That was called The Sound. And we That's had it. fun doing that. We, uh, we did a second one and, and called that Hello Outside. So those are the two cover records that we did um, which brings us to your current album more time and speaking of time i need to take a real quick break pete but uh we're gonna be right back so don't go anywhere everybody listening we are talking with pete muller singer songwriter piano player his new album is more time you can get it at pete 
You can find him on Facebook and Instagram at Pete Muller Music. I'm going to spell his last name, M-U-L-L-E-R. On YouTube, you can find him at Pete Muller Music as well. And we're going to go to break right now with See You Shine. This is one of my favorites of yours, Pete. I, I really like this song. It feels like it's, um, is it written? You don't have to tell me, but it feels like it's either written for somebody you really love or someone that you're watching grow up. It was definitely inspired by my son. Okay. The details have been changed. I was a nerd growing up and it took me a, a while to find my place in the world. Um, and uh, I, I wrote it for him and for anyone else that's taken a while uh, because, you know, they, they just, they're, their brain works slightly differently that, that, that you know, uh, that, that takes a while to find their, uh, their place in the world. And he really does love science and math. He, he mm -hmm. had math like mine, uh, but the details are different from him. He's, he said, um, yeah. So uh, it's a beautiful song and it's a, a, a great storytelling and one song you can say so much. Okay. Here it is. I'm going to go to break real quick with See You Shine by Pete Muller. Again, his new album is More Time. This song is off that new album. You can get it at PeteMuller.com. We'll be right back. Don't go away. 